Yeah, Ora, and welcome to this new episode of Art Yoga Pills. I have today with me my first international guest, Bruce Lipton. How are you, Bruce? I am a very happy person to be here with you in New Zealand and, and loving the world and uh, having a good day. And I think we have something wonderful to talk about. I think so, too. And I'm actually grateful to have this opportunity today. I was not expecting this at all. I thought that we were just going to have a conversation. Uh, but this is what it's going to be. It's anyway a conversation. It's just that it's going more deeply, which I'm really honored for it. Um, so the way that my podcast works is that I let you speak pretty much by giving you some uh, input. And then from there, we will see how this conversation goes. If you also have a question for me, I'm also happy to answer your question. But I know that you have such a deep knowledge that I wish for you to share more than I do. Well, I'll wait for you to start with a question. I'm ready to go. And if I can resolve that question within the next day or so, uh, we'll try a second question. Okay. Perfect. The, the first one is quite easy because it's, uh, I know that I well known who you are. And since you are internationally known, I'm assuming that most people will know who you are. But yet, there are some. Exactly. There are still some people that don't know who you are. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about that. And you can either describe yourself in a personal way or in a professional way or combining the two together, whatever suits you today. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I'm Bruce Lipton, of course. And then the point about it is this, is that I was a, a conventional um, a professor in a medical school teaching students about the understanding of genes. And at that time, it was called genetic determinism. And I was teaching students, which most everybody in this audience still has the same learning, <laughs> uh, that genes control our lives. And, and the significance about that is, as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes we came with. If we don't like the genes, you can't change them. And then, of course, you've heard over the years, genes turn on and genes turn off. Uh, when you put all those three things together, then you start to recognize your life is not really under your control. It's under the control of the genes that you inherited from other people. And since you can't change them or anything, do anything about it, then all of a sudden we become like victims of a, a belief that the genes control our lives. So that if someone in your family has cancer and uh, you start to believe, oh my goodness, there's a cancer gene in the family and I'm going to get the cancer. Uh, th this makes you feel powerless because it's like, oh, the genes cause the cancer. I'm, I'm just, you know, the recipient of the cancer. I can't change it. I can't do anything about it. So that belief system that most people and everybody, I believe, on this audience right now still comes from that same belief system that genes turn on and off and control their lives. Uh, we have to recognize and we perceive ourselves as victims of things out of our control. My genes did this to me. That's, you know, the story. That story, um, I, in my research at the university, uh, in the medical school, um, my research revealed that that story was not totally true. Matter of fact, it's totally false. <laughs> uh, what's false about it is genes don't turn on and off by themselves. Genes are blueprints to make parts of the human body, okay? So, well, the relevance about that is a blueprint doesn't control itself. You want a blueprint, you would see a blueprint in an architect's office. So you, you can ask your architect, you say, uh, uh, is this blueprint on or off? Uh, and she would look at you and go, there's no on and off. It's a blueprint. And I go, genes are blueprints. There's no on and off. It's the mind that is the architect that not only reads the blueprints, but can even modify the blueprints, meaning you're not a victim of your genetics. Your consciousness can select the genes and even alter the reading of the genes through your mind. And all of a sudden it said, well, then I'm not a victim because I can change my mind. And I can, I go, yes, you are a person who controls your own genes. This is a new science. In 1990, it was established and it's called epigenetics. Most people, as I said, are already in this audience program of the belief in genetics. Genes control my life. And I go, yeah, but that belief is 100% wrong because the new science, epigenetics, replaces it. Epi, the, when you put that in front of a word, epi means above. So, uh, you know, what, what do we call skin? E epidermis. I go, what does it mean? Above the dermis. Okay, there's a layer underneath called dermis, and then there's a layer on top called 
epi above the dermis epidermis okay epigenetics means the new science control epi above the genes and the new science reveals how our mind is actually creating the conditions that determine our genetics and our behavior and when we understand that all of a sudden it says and wait i'm not a victim of the genes that are running in my family i can rewrite all the programs i can change who i am i am free but you have to recognize that it is your mind that that is controlling this and this is where personal power comes from and you can change your life and i go first of all how much does the mind play in our life what role is the mind playing quantum physics and that's the most valid science on the planet recognizes fundamentally quantum physics fundamental consciousness is creating our life experiences that means the mind is creating all of this and the epigenetics is now the biology of that physics the epigenetics is how the mind creates all this which is the control of the genes so both quantum physics and new biology both recognize our thoughts are the creator of our reality and then all of a sudden it says yep <laughs> and i say well if your thoughts create your reality then how come we're all not living a heaven on earth how come there's so much trouble if your thoughts can create reality why don't we just have heaven hey life is beautiful life is great i love my life hey let's have heaven. okay i say that's possible matter of fact many of you in the audience may have even touched upon it i go what do you mean i said there's a unique opportunity in your life where you become the real creator of your life and that is when you fall in love and when you fall in love, there's a period right after you just met this person and the period right after, I'm calling it the honeymoon period. The honeymoon period is like, you think about it this way, your life is blah, 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 blah. And on this one day you meet somebody and you fall in love. I say 24 hours later, your life is not blah, blah, blah anymore. Your life is fun and beautiful and exciting and it's heaven on earth and everything is great. The food, the music, the love, everything is great. I go, How'd you go from blah, blah, blah <laughs> to honeymoon? Because it was a switch. And it's when your conscious creative mind took control back of your life. And the conscious mind is the mind with wishes and desires. And guess what? When two people meet and fall in love and they're both their conscious minds are making wishes and desires, what do you think the result is? Heaven on earth. And I go unfortunately that disappears at some period which i'll explain in a second but the significance is it was created that was your blah 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 went 24 hours later into life is so beautiful i go well that's really cool and then the issue is then why why doesn't it last that way okay so first you have to understand a the mind is creating our life experiences, our behavior, our genetics, our life character, okay? And the mind actually has two pieces to it that are interdependent. They, they, they both are part of the mind and control, but they do different things. I go, so what are the two? I say, well, I mentioned the conscious mind. That's the latest evolution in, in, in animals, and especially in humans. The conscious mind is creative. The conscious mind has imagination. And with imagination, you can manifest anything. Ah, but that's what humans are doing. Technologically, imagination, we can create it. I go, so the conscious mind is really cool. It's got wishes and desires and everything you want. There's a second mind, and it's called the subconscious mind. And But just by the name, subconscious, sub means below. So this mind operates when you're not paying attention. Okay, it's below your consciousness. It's happening and you're not even aware of it's happening, okay? The subconscious mind, consider the brain a computer and the subconscious mind is a hard drive. I go say, well, why is that important? I go, well, let's say you buy a computer and it doesn't have a hard drive. Nothing's, no program. Computer, you're brand new, brand new, no program. I say, do something. And you say, I can't. I say, why not? Well, first you have to have the program. Then you can use it. The human brain is a computer. 
before you could use it, you had to put a program in it. I said, where did the programs come from? And the answer is, from the last trimester of pregnancy through seven years of age, the mind of that individual is not functioning at the higher level of consciousness. It's focused, it's a, fi- a lower vibration. Oh, mind has vibration? I go, yeah. You put wires on a person's head, they call it electroencephalograph, and they read the electrical vibrations of the brain. A child's brain does not have the vibrational level of consciousness. It's just below. It's called theta. Theta is imagination. And this is why children under seven can mix the real world and the imaginary world and just live in both at the same time. The famous tea party. You pour nothing into the cup. You drink nothing. And you say, that was the best tea I ever had in my life. (laughs) I go, ah, imagination, reality. Riding a broom and thinking it's a horse. To the child on that broom who's thinking it's a horse, it's not a broom. At that thinking stage, it is now turned into a horse. So the mother says, give me the broom. And the child's like, what? (laughs) Because broom isn't even in the consciousness at that moment. So first seven years, imagination mixed with reality, theta, but that's also hypnosis. So I say, so why do I need hypnosis? And I say, well, how many rules does it take for you to be a member of a family? And how many rules does it take to be a member of a community, a culture? And I go, thousands of rules to be a member of the, you know, to do the right thing and live in harmony with the rest. You got to learn that. And I go, how does an infant learn that? Can't read, can't go to school, but it learns. I say, how does it do it? First seven years, theta, imagination is also hypnosis. The child learns behavior by watching the mother, the father, the siblings, and the community. And in that process, it acquires behavior by just observing them because theta is hypnosis. So if you're a girl, you look at your mom generally and go, that's the model. Whatever her behavior is, you downloaded that. You already got it. Your dad is the partner of your mom. So when you're looking at the concept of what is partner, the image of your dad shows up because that's the download. That's the mom. That's the dad. That's the program. How do they behave? Well, you want to be the mom. You're going to watch her behavior and you're downloading it. You watch your father, you see his behavior and you understand how the partner is supposed to interact and all that. I say, in other words, you're getting an understanding of how to live, not alone, but in a community, whether it's a small community of family or the community outside the door. And it's so much information. You couldn't learn it by an infant, couldn't read a book or go to school. Can't get it that way. So universe made it simple. The human mind up until age seven is like a video recorder, just watches and downloads the program. Now the problem, here's the problem. The conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind's got programs, habits. Okay. Now some of those habits are good. <laughs> You know, Denny, when did you learn how to walk? You Probably before age two. Guess what? I can give you some information. You could be 102 and still walk. Why? Once you downloaded that program, if it's, it's there the rest of your life, you know how to walk. And you don't forget how to walk. You don't even have to think about how to walk. Why? It's a habit. All you have to have is, I want to be over there. <laughs> and walking is automatic. Why? It's a habit. You didn't think of all the steps and things you had to do. It went below consciousness. It was controlled. The walking is controlled by the subconscious. You don't think about it. It just happens. Okay? The point is the subconscious is all the behavioral programs that we got from other people. Now, some of those people, their programs are not that good. (laughs) As a result, if you're a member of that family and you downloaded that behavior, you got a bad program. That happened to me. My father and mother is a dysfunctional relationship. Fine. What does that mean? As a kid, I modeled my behavior after my father. Dysfunctional. Point. As I grew up, that was the program that controlled how I related to other people, especially partners. And I go, so what was the result? I go, I couldn't get a relationship off the ground because my behavior was so dysfunctional from day one. I downloaded the behavior. Turns out about 60% of the behaviors we download from our parents and our family are 
disempowering programs, uh, limiting programs, self-sabotaging programs. And I say, yeah, so then a lot of the programs in our subconscious don't really support us. In fact, <laughs> they contradict something that we may want because it wasn't their program, but we downloaded their program. So I go, so what's the point? When you're in the conscious mind, you are the creator. Conscious mind's connected to your personal identity, your spirituality. You are the creator when you're in the conscious mind. But when the subconscious mind is taking over, the programs are the creator. Okay? So now I say, well, what's the point here? And I go, it turns out 95% of the day, your life is not controlled by your conscious mind. It's controlled by the sub conscious programs again sub below conscious meaning whatever behavior you're playing it's below your visibility you didn't see it it was automatic sub conscious okay and the significance is that 95 percent of the day we're playing programs that we're not paying attention to but they're automatic and they're not your programs they came from the programmer whoever you copy and the real the significance of that becomes very critical are you living the life that you want? Or are you living the life you've been programmed to have? Now, a lot of people have seen the movie, The Matrix. And I go, yeah, The Matrix, that's not science fiction. That, that's actually a documentary. Why? Everybody was programmed. That was the whole nature of the thing. We're all programmed. I go, that's real. That's not a fiction. We all got programmed. Zero to seven. I go, but what was interesting is everybody was caught in the program until you could get out of the program. And that was the red pill that they took. And the relevance about that is when we fall in love, that's the same as taking the red pill. I go, what happens? You stop playing the program. Then what happens? You start creating from wishes and desires. Hence, your life was blah, 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 fell in love, red pill, stop the program, play the new one you want, honeymoon. And then I go, then what happens? I go, well, unfortunately, your life gets very busy and you start thinking. And that's when the subconscious is like autopilot. When you are thinking, your conscious mind's not looking at the world because thinking is inside. I say, hey, Denny, today's Wednesday. Tell me what you're doing on Friday. Um, actually, I know I will go to do yoga and then I will go to do life drawing. But okay. I needed to think. Where I didn't notice that? my eyes. Was yes, and where was that written just now? Did you see that someplace? Where'd you see that? I think I had a picture of my calendar in my head. Inside somewhere. Head. Inside, inside my head. head. When you are thinking, your attention in conscious mind, which is the one looking for the answer, was inside your head. It wasn't looking out. I go, yeah, but what if you're driving the car and then you start thinking? I go, conscious mind looking inside your head i said then who's driving the car because who's looking out and i go subconscious is autopilot when the conscious mind is busy the subconscious mind takes over okay the point is we think 95 percent of the day and that's how much of our life is being run by the sub below conscious programming are you living your life 5% of the day is how much you're creating wishes and desires. 95% of the day you are playing those programs and you don't see it. I go, so why is that important? I go, well, let's say you have a friend and you know your friend's behavior pretty well. And you know your friend's father or mother. And you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent. This excites you. So you really want to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And I say, back away from Bill. And what do you mean? I say, the moment you say that, I know exactly what Bill's going to say. And, it, and, I, and he's going to say, I'm not like my dad. I'm nothing like my dad. What are you talking about? And the point about it is everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one that can't see it is Bill. Explanation? Where did Bill get the programming from? From observing his father. When he's playing those programs, why is he playing that program and the answer is because he's not paying attention he's thinking i go then does he see the program no does everybody else see the program yes i go huh? you ready for this one 
we are all Bill. Every one of us is doing this every day. I go, so why is this important? I go, are you creating your life? Are you playing a program? The answer is I can tell you right now you're playing a program. And that's not your life. That was what you downloaded. And behaviors are passed down from generation to generation in that first seven years. And things like, very important, people say, oh, well, cancer is caused by a gene and that's running in my family. My mother had breast cancer. My grandmother had breast cancer. I, I got the breast cancer gene. I could get the breast cancer. And I go, the gene didn't cause breast cancer. <laughs> what caused breast cancer? Well, let me put it this way, simply. The breast cancer gene is called BRCA gene. Guess what? Only 50% of the women that carry the gene actually get the cancer. I said, wait, wait, wait. I say, what does that mean? I say, 50% of the women that have the gene never get the cancer. Oh, wait a minute. Then having the gene itself didn't cause the cancer. I go, yes. It's not living in harmony. It's causing a disharmony in your life that's manifesting a disease. Disharmony in your consciousness leads to disharmony in the body. And that disharmony in the body is expressed as disease. Okay, disharmony in the mind, that's a lot of emotional issues and psychology and all that. But that disharmony, when it plays into the body, adjusts the body. That's why cancer is carried in families, not because of the gene. It's carried in families because the programming is passed in the first seven years. And people didn't really recognize that. And I go, well, wait, they did. The Jesuits, the Catholic organization, they have told their followers for 400 years. They have said, give me a child until it is seven and I will show you the man. And I go, people go, oh, that's nice. I said, no, you didn't, you didn't understand what they just said. Give me the child for seven years. That means let me program the child. And then after age seven, 95% of the, that child's life is coming from that program. They were the first ones to know you could program this thing. And of course, guess what? They created something called Catholic school. Catholic school programmed them. <laughs> and they programmed them. Guess what? Oh, yeah, I got programmed as Catholic, but I don't really believe in it. I go, yeah, 95% of your life is now programmed that you will. And uh, and that's the point. And I said, but all of us got programmed. It wasn't based on the religion. It got programmed because that's how you get your feet on the ground as a kid to become a member of this community. But unless <laughs> uh, your, your program is, a, is your life, 95% of your life is a printout of this program. So look at your life, simple point. Point is this, are you thinking wonderful, happy thoughts all the time? Most of our thoughts are concerned with our survival. Will I have enough food, money, healthcare, blah, 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 blah. I go, those are thoughts that are controlling your biology and most of those are fear thoughts and your life doesn't manifest the positive thoughts it will manifest the fear thoughts because whatever the picture is in your mind that is the manifestation of your life and that's why the first seven years are really important because they will shape your life and your life will be that program until you change the program and you can do that I presume you probably would like me to say something about change the program. I'm, would that be true? I was going to, yes. I, I believe also that you are more than happy to share. I think that what comes to my mind is related in particular with the honeymoon effect that you shared about. Yes. And I wonder if um, by sharing how we can reprogram our life, more than imagining ourselves to fell in love with someone i wonder if it could be more uh fell in love with ourselves which is the hardest things that i think thank you many if not the whole human experience might might thank have you. the struggle with you're 100 percent correct on that and when i work with belief change groups and we do a belief you know check a personal belief one of the beliefs we check is i love myself 80 to 90 percent of every audience will not test positive for I love myself. And I'll give you a simple reason is when a player on a sports team is not doing well, the coach of the team doesn't go, oh, please do better. No, the coach of the team is like, come on, you're not good enough. You don't deserve to be on the team. Work harder. Who do you think you are? 
They criticize the kid. But the kid older than seven understands that, oh, the coach is saying, I'm not working hard enough and I'll work harder. When a parent acts as a coach and the kid is under seven and they want to, you know, push them, like, that's not good enough. You don't deserve this. You're not lovable. Who do you think you are? They're just saying that like a coach, do better. But the child under seven, remember, the brain function is not in consciousness yet. It's in that imagination theta thing, record. I said, what did the child in that, when the parents were acting as a coach, what did the child record? Criticism. Not good enough, not worthy enough, not lovable, blah, 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 blah. I go, but if a child's under seven and they hear that, they don't understand what the parent means that, hey, I should do better. They just recorded it. I'm not deserving. I'm not lovable. I'm not this. I'm not that. And I go, well, that's a recording. And that recording is now in your subconscious. And I go, yeah. And guess what? That behavior will manifest 95% of your life, whatever that was. And that's when we become self-critical because we go back in our, who am I? I'm not deserving. Oh, I'm not lovable. Oh, I'm not good enough. That's what I, my message is. I go, well, if that's your message, what do you think you're playing <laughs> through through your mind? You're manifesting that criticism. Well, when you become self-critical, then you're not self-loving. Because if you look at yourself, I love myself. You're, oh, yeah, but uh, I'm not deserving and I'm not good enough. I love myself. No, I'm, you know, I'm not that good. And I go, well, you just sabotage yourself with these programs. And that's why the largest majority of people cannot love themselves because their initial programming from parents acting as coaches said things that were recorded into the subconscious to become habits. And they're not empowering. And that's all of a sudden why people can't love themselves. And I agree with you 100%. Until you can love yourself by absolute law, you cannot be loved by anybody else. You say, I'm not lovable. And somebody says, I love you. And you look at them and say, you got no quality control. I know I'm not lovable. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, and, and we will push them away and they won't be there. And then guess what you think you'll hear right after you push them away? Well, nobody's here. I'm not lovable. I <laughs> just push them away. <laughs> so, oh, it says time running out. I got a couple of minutes left here. and. Uh, uh how about if i say Please. part one very nice talk to you oh, more sometime yeah. but we'll put it that off a later good. date okay that's wonderful we can leave it just there where you were about to share with us uh how we can reprogram ourselves okay then let me just close then with this on my website yes we have nine okay. minutes left it says okay. so you okay. might have some little time to close yes. my website is bruceslipton.com under resources, there's two different things. One is a directory, a directory of belief change modifications, techniques that you can change an existing belief in minutes once you know what you want to change, okay? And that's under the directory. But there are other categories, relationships with job, health, and blah, blah, blah. Those all have videos of me giving a lecture about those topics or presentation. So I want to make it easy for everybody. Under resources, check out belief change. And then under belief change, a directory is these are what are called energy psychology, a new way of programming psychology, much better than conventional psychology. And then there's also a list of topics about uh, beliefs. And those are different uh, interviews and videos that I have about those specific topics. And that's a great resource. And it's free. So there's no problem with that. Just go to brucelipton.com resources and check it out. And uh, therefore, I just gave an option for people who really want to take care of their life and change their life, a place to go and what they can do. Because those topics will be discussed in full on how to create the life you want not the one you were programmed to experience and just to close very simply this i said that 
my relationship problem was dysfunctional relationships for over 40 years. I couldn't get a relationship. But using some of those techniques that are on that resource I just said, I changed my belief system and then learned to love myself. And once I did that, guess what? I met my wonderful partner, Margaret. And the beautiful part about it is this. We also changed the old program so that my new programs are from my wishes and desires. My new programs are, what do I want? What, you know, change my life so that my subconscious programs have the same wishes and desires as my conscious mind. And then guess what? Whether I'm paying attention or not paying attention, I'm still manifesting heaven on earth. 30 years of honeymoon. How do you do that? We have to rewrite those limitations that we had. And so I uh, just uh, should direct everybody to the website, brucelipton.com, under resources, belief change. And to add on that, also, I would like to share that there are three amazing books that you wrote, Biology of Belief, The Honeymoon Effect, and Spontaneous Evolution, which I will highly recommend to everyone. And for those who are in Oakland, here in New Zealand, there will be also a beautiful lecture led by you in April on the 19th that is called The New Biology. That's the title that I picked, but I saw that there are so many beautiful subtitle underneath i got already my ticket and i will invite everybody that wish to know more than what we had, we were able to share in this space today yes, but it's to available get your anytime. ticket it's available anytime they just want to take a look at something they can click on a on a a, a short interview about what these topics were of how to change these beliefs and take your power back because when you do that you do become the creator Thank you so much, Bruce. From my point of view, what I can share about um, as a testimony of your sharing, I can say that three years ago when I personally see one of your video, I didn't know who you were and synchronicity led me to come to one of your lectures, exactly in the same place where I will go now uh, after three years time. And the first time that I came to your lecture, I make this commitment with myself that one day I was going to be able to have an interview with you. And here we are today making my own core belief and dream come true. So I really appreciate your time. I will understand if we might not have additional time after this, but if for anybody that wish to discover more, even with your free resources, I will with my heart, invite them to do so. And anyway, everything will be below this episode for everybody just to click in without going and searching on Google. Everything will be available. But meanwhile, Bruce, thank you so, so much for your time. And I can't wait to see you again in person at your lecture. Thank you. And everybody who is listening, I hope you've been inspired by all this sharing. And I hope you're going to have a lovely, lovely day. Thank you, everyone.